I have a very simple message this morning. John chapter 3, a very familiar passage. John chapter 3. It is my goal to convince you of something this morning. I'm just going to let you know. I have one point that you're going to hear over and over again, and I aim to convince you of that point. John chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 15 just to kind of understand what's going on here. Like I said, a very familiar passage. John chapter 3. The Word of God says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter in a second time to his mother's room and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh. And whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that which, uh, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and have received not of our, uh, we have received not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Verse number 13, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life or eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I am to convince you of one point today, and it is a point that in our text, if you have a Bible that is red letter edition, it is a point Christ made again and again and again and again in this conversation with this religious man. Ye must be born again. That is my aim. That is my goal. Uh, what, is, what, is the, what is the most needful thing in this hour of history? Is it more clean energy? Is it more programs to help people? Is it, is it, is it more of, 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 of social things to take care of people? Those are all great things. And yes, those are all needful things for the most part. Um, and I, I, I'm behind taking care of people and loving people and being charitable. Don't get me wrong. Those things are somewhat needful. But the greatest need this world has right now is not a physical temporary need met. This world has a need that only a spiritual need can be met. People need Christ. People need to be born again. People need not life from this world, but life from the next. Mankind's greatest need is a new birth. You must be born again. Uh, we don't need money or fame. We don't need a vast host of friends or well-wishers. You say, well, that would be nice. But we don't need that because those things come and they go. I don't know if, if you're the same way, but have you noticed that money, the Bible says, sometimes grows wings and flies away? You ever noticed that? Have you noticed that it seems like when you're up, you have a lot of friends. And when you're down, it seems like you don't have very many friends. People are like the, are like the sea tide. They come up and they come down. Things change. Things happen. Your life changes. You have good times. You have bad times. But there's one constant thing that everybody needs to be born again. You say, Peter, I'm not understanding. What is that term born again? Well, we'll study that. Uh, George Whitfield, the famous preacher... He would always herald, you must be born again. You must be born again. He would preach that time and time again. And a person came to him and said, George Whitfield, why are you preaching? You must be born again. He paused, looked at the gentleman and said, because you must be born again. It is a simple thing, but yet a profound thing. It is not something that I've come up with. It is something that Christ has spoken. And this is an eternal word that he wants us to hear this morning. I aim to convince you of a few things. I convince you of three things. First of all, Religious people need a new birth. Number one, religious people need a new birth. Look at verse number one. It says there was a man of the Pharisees. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, underline that. Pharisees. Name Nicodemus. And it says a ruler of the Jews. Now, who is, who is the man that has come to Christ at night? 
Christ in the, in the daytime is obviously healing people. He's teaching. He has mass crowds around him. Finally, Christ has, has, a, has a dinner break, if you will. He gets away from the crowds. He's by himself. And this religious man comes to see him. The Bible says that he was a Pharisee. Pharisees were very strict separatists. They, they were a, a category of people that were above reproach, if you will. They had, uh, they had the law of Moses, and they, imply, they put on themselves an additional 613 oral traditions that they would keep. That he was a very regimented person. He was a very religious person. The Bible says he was a Pharisee, and he was a ruler of the Jews. This is a guy who was on the Sanhedrin, which was like the supreme religious supreme court of that day. So this is not a slouch. This is a guy who's earned his doctorate. This is a guy who knows his stuff. This is a guy who people go to for advice on spiritual things. This is a very religious man. And the Bible says that Nicodemus comes to him and he says he calls calls Christ rabbi, which is this wonderful compliment, you know, because Jesus didn't have any rabbinical training. He didn't go to all the universities that, that Nicodemus went to. Jesus, for, you know, for the most part, had no particular schooling. He was just, you know, God and knew everything, right? So this rabbi comes with his doctorates and, and, and all of his, his labels and all of his religious trappings, and he says, Oh, you're a rabbi. Even though you're not learned like me, you're a rabbi, and you must be teaching things from God. Notice this religious man shows up in his pomp and he says, oh, I'm, I'm going to pay you a compliment. And you'll look at my religious outward appearance. You'll look at my compliment. You'll see my life and you'll give me audience. And notice what Christ says. Christ hears what he says and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see it. I, I see this man who did his very best to live a blameless life. He was very success, uh, successful in his religion because of it. You know, Jewish tradition says that Nicodemus was one of the three richest men in Jerusalem. So this is a guy who's dedicated to his job, right? He, he's a religious separatist. He's in the Bible, uh, the Old Testament. And those, those guys, for the most part, memorized the first five books of the Bible. That's how religious this guy was. So this guy comes with his religious trappings. He comes with his degrees. He comes with all of the things that he has earned. He comes with his religious heritage. He comes with, you know, I'm, I'm of the stock of Abraham. I'm an Israelite. And what was interesting is in that day, they even believed, that a, a Jew believed, that just because they were Jewish, they were automatically guaranteed heaven. Because we're Abraham's descendants. So he comes with all these trappings. He comes with everything that he has built in religion. And the very first thing out of Christ's mouth is, ye must be born again. How can these things be? You know, I think a lot of people need to hear this. Religious people need a new birth. This man comes. Christ doesn't bat an eye. What truth is being taught here? Your religious training... Your pedigree, your success in the spiritual fear, your righteous living, your rope prayers will not save you. You must be born again. You, you can have a wall of divinity degrees on your wall. You can do that, but you'll still die in your sin. We, you, know, you can have a personal reformation. You can decide, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to live right. I'm going to be the most religious, separatist person. I'm going to read the Bible every day. I'm going to pray every day. I'm going to give alms. I'm going to serve God in the church 24-7. But if you've never been born again, just like in Nicodemus, you need to be born again. You must be born again. God is not so concerned with the outer trappings of what you bring him. A lot of times, religious people are like a whited, like a whited sepulcher. They are very religious on the outside, but they're dead on the inside, full of dead man's bones. God is looking on the inside and seeing a, a terrible, sinful heart. He's not caring about your outward religion. Notice Christ drives us home and says, if you're not born of water and of the spirit, if you don't have a physical birth and a spiritual birth, you can't enter in the, uh, the kingdom because flesh produces flesh and spiritual things produce spiritual things. Look at that. Let's go to that together. Let's, let's see the actual words of Christ here. <clears throat> Christ says that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. What, what, is, what is Christ telling this religious person? Flesh produces flesh. What does that mean? A man cannot produce a cat. A camel cannot produce a man. Men you know, flesh produces after its own flesh. People beget people, right? Spiritual things beget spiritual things. Here's the application. When Adam sinned, he passed down some traits 
to the future generations. You know, I was talking about this in my Sunday school. Um, you know, I think about alcoholism, um, and I think about how that, uh, how that is kind of prevalent in some families that I know, and how it passes down seemingly from generation to generation. Whether it's with drug use or whether it's alcohol, it seems like the, the, sometimes the father's in it, the, 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 the son of the father's in it, his son, and then his children, and it seems like generation to generation, this, uh, you know, the, the physicians call it a disease. They say it's passed down from generation to generation. Flesh begetting flesh. Carnal things begetting carnal things. When Adam messed up, when Adam sinned in the garden, you know what he did? He passed down that sin nature. You say, why am I such a sinner? Blame your dad. Right? Blame your granddad. Blame, blame your granddad because he gave it to you. You know, uh, I'll, I'll stop there before I get in trouble. But so we have these things that are passed down. Christ is saying, listen, you understand flesh produces flesh. You're a byproduct of what Adam did. Adam messed up. Adam brought sin to the whole world. And that lying that you do in your heart, that coveting that you do in your heart, all of those evil things, you get it from your father. Flesh produces flesh. And he says, but spiritual things produce spiritual things. What, what is the application here? I wrote some things down. Adam sinned and marred himself. He produced another fallen, per fallen person. And they produced another fallen person. And that continued generation to generation, passing down sin to all men. Men breed sinners. Our first birth, which is that born of water, was a corrupt birth. The Bible says we are shapen in iniquity. We need an entirely new birth. You know, Nicodemus said, well, how can, I, how can I be born again? Do I enter into my mother's womb again? And then, listen, I'm an old guy. Can, can, I, be, can I enter into her womb again and get born again? Is that what you're saying, Jesus? I literally have to be physically born again? You could be born again physically a hundred times, and you'd still have a sin nature. The Bible says that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all a bunch of sinners. We're sinners by nature. But a lot of times we're also sinners by choice, aren't we? You want to know why? Because it's been passed down from generation to generation, all the way back to Adam's decision, and he passed, about, he passed down that corrupt, moral, evil nature. That's what we have. You know, there's a, there's a story of, of a man who was trying to make sure his doctor knew the Lord and his doctor was on his way to heaven. And he was witnessing to him and, and telling him about forgiveness and he was telling him about how Christ died for him and the man just he, what, didn't, didn't concern him at all. He wouldn't have anything to do with it. And this was a doctor. This is a man who delivered you know, hundreds of hundreds of children. He was a family doctor. He was a very respected man in the community. And finally the man exasperated said, you need to be born again. And that doctor, like a light bulb went off. And this is what he said. I love this. He said, that's what I need. A baby has no past, only a future. That's what I need. Fleshly things are going to produce fleshly things. You can't escape it. It's like a circle that never is broken. Sin begetting sin, sin begetting sin. It's never broken. But there's a spiritual circle that you can go to where there's no past and it's only a future. You must be born again. Religious people need it. You know, I said, uh, you know, the Jews love their first birth. They love their, they love their religious heritage. They love what they grew up in. They loved the law. They loved all these things. You know what's interesting? Let's say us Gentiles, we decided that we wanted to become, you know, a proselyte. Uh, a, we wanted to be a, a Jewish convert. The Jew would baptize us because we were unclean, saying that we needed to be born again. You want to know why? Because they love their heritage. They love what they came from. They love their nation. They they love their first birth. But Christ looks at this gentleman, and let me put it all together. Here he comes with his first birth. He comes with his religious heritage. He comes with his church attendance. He comes with his Bible degrees on the wall. He comes with his good works. He comes with everything that this world looks at and says, that's a moral guy. That's a good guy. Christ looks at all of the religious trappings, all of the good deeds that this man brought, and he said, ye must be born again. Excuse me? I... We tell Gentiles they need to be born again. And Christ, you're looking at me and saying, I need to be born again? Yes, flesh produces flesh. Spiritual things produce spiritual things. Our past is stained with evil and sin. We need a new birth. Christ uses that. He says, your first birth is sinful. You're the one who needs to, you're the one who needs to be born again. Religion, I wrote this, religion may take you far in this life, but it won't take you to heaven. You know what, Will? A personal relationship with Christ. Being born again into God's family. Listen, I, I don't know if I'm preaching this morning. I don't know if, I don't know if, if maybe I'm connecting. But let me, let, me, let me phrase one thing. Let me say this one thing. You must be born again. 
If we're not connecting, I don't know, maybe I'm doing a bad job. Maybe I'm not conveying scripture to minds. But listen, there's one thing we need to understand. We must be born again. We're a bunch of spirit. We're a bunch of carnal people. We're sinners. We've broken the law of God, and we deserve hell. And no matter how many leaps we turn, we're still sinners. Catch that? No matter how many times we're, we're, we're born in our mother's womb, no matter how many times we recommit ourselves to do right, no matter how many times we show up to church, no matter how many times we give alms and we pray and we try to be good people, there's still that hole in our heart. There's still that sin nature. There's still that separation from us and God. Religious people need to realize that you cannot trust your good works to get you to heaven. There's only one way to heaven, and Christ looks at us this morning and says, ye must be born again. Ye must. Catch that. The importance of it. Christ didn't say, well, you could be if you want. He, he also says you cannot see it and you cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You know, just like a baby, like we said, has no past, only a future. You need to be born again. You need to be born again. Religious people need it. But I also will say this. Academics need a new birth too. Look at uh, verse number 7. Verse number 7. He says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. He says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest it not thereof, but thou canst, uh, thou canst not, not tell whence it cometh, and whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Verse number 9. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered unto him and said, um, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Think about who Nicodemus was. He's a master of Israel. We talked about that people came to him for advice. He was so powerful in Jerusalem. He was one of the, top, he was one of the three richest men, right? He was a guy who had degrees. He was a guy who people looked to for advice. If they ever read in the Torah and they go, I don't understand what Moses is saying in the Old Testament, they could go to him and say, hey, can you explain these things? This was a guy who knew his craft. You know, how many of you guys have ever been to a doctor and it seems like they don't know what they're talking about? You're like, you don't know what you're talking about. For example, um, Carrie, what was it, your gallbladder? So I, the, as much doctor training, I'm, I'm like a WebMD certified person. You know, I, I've died four times, I'm pretty sure, per WebMD. You know, if I have a stomach cramp, it's cancer. I mean, I'm one of those people. I'm always bad news bears. Um, and so Carrie called me. She was taking care of her grandmother, and she started having chest pains really, really bad. She thought she was having a heart attack. So we go to the hospital, and the smug guy, you know who I'm talking about, not a particular person, but that smug doctor with his degrees more than people skills. You know what I'm saying? Am I preaching this morning, right? You know what I'm talking about? He doesn't have a bedside manner. He has a degree. He doesn't care. So this guy runs all the tests. He looks at, He doesn't even come in the room to give us the results. He sends a nurse in and says, send her home. All the while, she's still clutching her chest. She's fine. She's fine. And my question was, aren't there other organs around where she's hurting? Per WebMD, I'm not, I'm not smart, but I can Google chest pain, cause. You know what I'm saying? And he looked at me with disdain. You're a master of Israel, and you can't even WebMD this? You see what I'm saying? It's simple. And you know what happened? I love this. We had one doctor. His name was Dr. Love. I kid you not. His name was Dr. Love. And Dr. Love comes in the room. No, I'm joking. Dr. Dr. Love comes in the room, and he, he goes, what's the problem? He literally goes, gallbladder. One minute. No test. Just the old-fashioned way. Oh, ow, gallbladder. A good doctor, right? This one doctor had so much. He had, he had too many dollars, not enough cents. Catch what I'm saying? He knew a whole lot, but he couldn't process the basic things. So Jesus looks at this academic, this guy who comes with his degrees. He comes with his understanding. And Christ gives a simple example. He says, listen, let's WebMD this. You need to be born again. Your first heritage is corrupt. <gasps> what? You need a new birth completely. But I like my heritage. I like my religion. I like what I bring to the table. Ye must be born again. Academics, religious people, we all need it. He's a master of Israel. He had academic pursuits conquered. But he had degrees and honors. But he needed a new birth. Nicodemus didn't understand how this all works out. Jesus basically uses an example. He says, listen, the wind has its own laws. It doesn't answer to you. It does what it wants. Spiritual things are like the wind. It's invisible to the mortal eye. You may not see the wind, but you feel its effects. 
You know, some of you, maybe you're sitting in this room today and the Spirit of God is doing something to your heart. I need to be born again. And you feel the twisting. You feel the conviction. And you're looking around and nobody has their hand on your heart doing that. You can't see it, but you feel the effects. Listen, when you, know, when you look at the wind, I, and this is, this is a place where I have seen wind like I cannot imagine. I step outside, it punches me in the face. I'm like, this is some wind. Y'all got some wind in this state. I've never seen wind like this in my life. You know, just because I can't see the wind fist that hits me in the face, I still understand it's there. I can still feel its effects. When you walk out in the morning and you immediately just do this, and you walk back in, you know what I'm saying? It's that cold. It cuts you. We understand wind. We understand it's there. Wind does what it wants. And the Spirit of God is the same way. Though we don't understand it, though we can't see where it comes from, we still understand its effects. You say, Peter, I've never seen the hand of God and the Spirit of God. Let me encourage you. There are a bunch of people in this room who have been affected by the Spirit of God. There are a bunch of people who came as sinners, and God has changed them into sons of God. There are people who came here with a baggage of sin, who, who came with a load of grief, with a load of problems, with a load of, with a load of regrets, with a load of sin, with a load of transgressions, if you will. And they come to Christ and said, the best I know how, I'm just trusting you as my Savior. And God has cleansed their record. God has given them a new life. God has given them peace with him. God has given them access into his favor. God has done so many good things. The wind does what it wants. In the spirit of God, though we cannot see it, it still works. Academics need it. Smart people need it. Nicodemus, you don't need to understand everything to believe. You know, some people I believe are like this. Some people need to understand every little facet before they make a decision. It's like spiritual things. It's like buying a car. Well, you're telling me, so I got to do X, Y, Z. What's the after effect? Well, what do I have to give up? Well, what about this? Well, what about that? Well, I don't understand that. Well, how does that happen? And they get into this whole academic pursuit of Christian, of spiritual things. And there are people who will never make a decision to trust Christ because it doesn't all add up. I just don't understand point A to point B. Listen, there's only one thing we have to understand. Number one, we're all sinners. Number two, our sin has separated us from a holy God. And number three, Jesus Christ has died and risen again to save us. And the very best we know how, all we have to do is put our faith and trust in Christ, and he takes care of the rest. He gives us that new birth. He gives us that new light. I, can I give you a testimony? There was a time in my life when I was searching for peace. Can I be honest with you? You say, well, I've never heard a preacher give a testimony like this. Listen, there were times in my life where I was searching for God. I went to Buddhism, Islam. I went to Satanism. I went to, honestly, I went to the far corner I even went to Greek mythology. I, I played with agnosticism and atheism. And from point A to point B, you know what I found? Emptiness. You know what I found? Just an academic pursuit, but no hope. You know what I found? I found that it just made it worse. I found that the more I studied religion, the more empty I got. The more I studied these polytheism you know, systems, the more I understand how deep the hole in my heart was how much I was missing something, how I couldn't get peace. I could have knowledge, and I could have friends, and I could have money, and I could have success, but I could never fill that hole in my heart. I could never get that peace, and I searched, and I searched, and I searched, and it only came to me when I said, Lord Jesus, I trust you. And I said, I don't know all the religious terms. I don't know point A to point B, but I know one thing. You died for me, and if you'll save me, I'll put my trust in you. And can I tell you, from that day onward, I had peace. You want to know why? Because babies have no past. All they have is a future. And God, I promise you, his Bible says that if you come to him, he'll make you a new creature. Those old things that have plagued you will pass away. And all things will become new. Do you, do you see my heart this morning? Academics need it. It doesn't all have to make sense for you to make a heart decision. You know, I think about this. I don't know if you've ever, for those of you that have children, if you ever took them to a public pool, and I used this in Sunday school this morning. I'm sorry, I used the same thing. Or maybe you put your, your child on the counter, you said jump. Any of you all ever do that at the pool or on the counter and say, hey, jump, I'll catch you. Or maybe, uh, maybe I'm the one throwing out bad parenting advice. Right? So you, you, you put the child on the, on the edge. You say, jump to me. I'll catch you. And what does that child do? Right? Am, am I lying? 
that unless you just have a kid who totally trusts you and they just cannonball, oh gosh, you know, and it's like, okay, I understand you trust me, right? Most kids are going to do this. That's a long drop. I, I don't understand. I, I don't understand. And then eventually they have to just either go, no, it doesn't make sense. I don't want to do it. Or they'll go, they'll jump. You see what I'm saying there? People who hold on to this mental ascent of I believe God is, is alive are like the people who go, I believe dad's going to catch me. I believe dad's going to catch me. I believe he's there. I believe his hands are big enough. Listen, you know what salvation is? Salvation is like that little kid going, I don't understand the mechanics of how his muscles are going to catch me. I don't understand how strong he is. I don't understand how his feet are placed and how that is going to give him a greater base to catch me. I don't understand all the science about it. But you know what I understand? That his hands are outstretched and that all I have to do is trust him. And listen, I encourage you. All you have to do is trust him. All you have to do is in childlike faith, come to Christ and he'll catch you. You will leave with peace and a new life because babies have no past, just a future. He'll save you and he'll give you a new life. You know, I think about criminals sometimes enter into witness protection. They get a new name, right? If they're really bad... <laughs> They get a new place. They get a pension. They're basically, you know, they're, they, they go into hiding, right? But you know what's scary about that? There's still a file somewhere with all of their deeds. There's still people who are after them. That's why they have to hide. God's not offering witness protection. God is offering through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, a clean file and a brand new name in heaven. God is offering a home in glory with our loved ones. Have you, have you lost somebody and you know they're saved and you know they're in heaven? Academics need it. Academics need it. And Nicodemus can't see his need for spiritual transition or transformation. What else can Christ tell him? If you won't understand an earthly illustration about the wind, what else? A heavenly one? Listen, we don't need a PhD in religion. You don't need to have 30 years of religious academia. You just have to have simple faith of a child to believe God. Lord Jesus, the best I know how, I trust you. Have you ever just taken somebody at their word and they fulfilled their word? And then they come to you again and they say, hey, I'll take care of this. And you, have, you don't have a hard time trusting them again because they fulfilled their word. Listen, God promised that he would give his son. And he did. And Jesus met the demands of all of our sin. So he's kept his word once. You know what he's telling us? I'll keep my word again. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You may say, I'm too bad. I've messed up. I'm too evil. I I've gone too far away from God. There's too much sin. There's too much evil. Listen, when Jesus died, he died as our sin. God punished him in our place as our substitute. And that leads me to my third point. The whole world needs a new birth. Look at these verses. Oh, I love this part. And as Moses, verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You may, not be over, you may not be overly religious this morning. I get it. You may not consider yourself an, an academia type person. I get it. But you're, you're a whosoever person. You're just a part of this world. We're all a bunch of sinners. We're all on our way to hell. And God has provided a way for a clean record and a home in heaven. The Bible says that, Christ says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You say, Peter, what's that example? Can I tell you? Back in the Old Testament, in Numbers, the nation of Israel, they're walking around. Moses is leading them. They complain. They're trying to just chide with Moses, and God gets upset. He's like, all right, I'm done with this. You guys are driving me nuts. So the Bible says that he sends these serpents, like these fiery serpents, that start biting the people because they're, they're rebelling against Moses, and he's trying to quell the rebellion. And these serpents are biting these people, and they're dying. And God comes to Moses, and he says, listen, I want you to take a pole, and I want you to make a serpent out of brass. Put it on that pole and lift it up. And the people that will just look to, the, to that lifted thing, right, they'll be delivered. You know what brass is a picture of in the Bible? I wrote this down because I'm not smart enough to remember it. 
Christ, so Christ uses another example. He tells Moses to build a bronze serpent and hang it on a pole, right? Um, brass in the Bible is a symbol of judgment. And serpents are a symbol of evil or sin. So he was making a bronze serpent. It is the picture of our judgment for sin. So here's the idea. So these, these people sin against Moses, right? God sends judgment in the midst of them to bite them. And the venom is coursing through their veins. And they're going to die. And God says, I'm going to hold up a standard for all of you to see. And all you need to do is just look. Catch that? Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You think about how they were delivered from the venom running through their, from their veins. Faith. God didn't say, listen, give 20% of your money and I'll deliver you from the poison in your veins. God didn't say, you know, build the tabernacle, you know, uh, furniture and do X, Y, or Z or do all these good works. All he said was look. There's no working and looking, is there? And when you look to something, you trust it. Can I give you this personal, can I give you just this, exam, this, this application? Jesus Christ, just like that serpent, was lifted high for the world to see. And if we will, like those ancients, look to him for salvation. We don't have venom running through our veins this morning. But you know what you have? Sin. A sin that is headed for your heart. And one day will stop your heart. And forever and ever you will be judged apart from God. But there's a remedy. Not just, academ not just academics folks need it. Not just religious folks need it. But all us other sinners, <laughs> we need it. God has provided salvation through the cross. The Bible tells us, He who knew no sin became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Christ was made a curse for us on that tree. God so loved the world, He let Christ die as us, cursed and forsaken. The God says, Whosoever, God purchased it for the whole world. Now listen, I understand, I understand working for things. I, I'm, I'm about a hard day's work. I'm about putting in labor. L hear me out. I am all about doing what you should do. Don't get me wrong. But the Bible says that he has provided salvation and we can't boast. Right? It is by grace are you saved through faith and not, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you could work your way to heaven, you know what you would do that first day? You'd walk in. I was a priest. I read my Bible every day. I gave 30% to the church. You be Peter, you didn't have to die on an upside down cross. John the Baptist, you didn't have to get your head cut off, just tithe more. Can you imagine? You know, oh, well, I wouldn't do that, preacher. We'd all do it. You know it. We'd walk in heaven and be like, I earned those streets. I earned this. Oh, this robe. Mm -hmm. This life of good works. You know what? We're that's us. We're sinners. The Bible says that it is by grace. You know what that is? God knew that we couldn't do nothing. Can I just use some, a southern phraseology? We couldn't do nothing. <laughs> we couldn't bring anything to the table. The Bible says that all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. That's the idea of it for you medical people. Um, if you look at uh, leprosy in the Old Testament, people's hands, you know, fingers and stuff falling off, it was just gross. And in the Old Testament, they would wrap themselves together. And because they didn't have a cure for leprosy and, and of the hygiene of that day, the law of the land was if you had leprosy, you had to announce yourself from a distance and say, unclean, unclean. So if somebody was walking by, they would walk further away so they wouldn't catch your leprosy. God looks at our good works as leprous garments because he compares it to the perfect work of Christ. So I don't care how religious you are. I don't care how much church attendance you have. I don't care how many prayers you pray. I don't, have, I don't care how much you give to the church. All of your righteousness are filthy, leprous rags. You know what you need to do? You need to take off the old coat and put on the new one. Do you see what I'm saying? Christ has given you his righteousness. And he says, take it. Take it. But God, I didn't earn it. It's already paid for. But God, I don't deserve it. It's already paid for. But God, why would you love me? I just love you. You don't deserve it, but I love you. Give me that coat. I'll take your sin upon me to the cross. I'll pay your sin. I'll carry your sin away. I'll take you to heaven, and I'll give you my record. I'll put my righteousness on you. I will settle it all. All you have to do is take it. Well, I don't want to owe God nothing. Praise God. I can't wait to see his face 
and to for eternity worship him and thank him. I don't deserve it. I'm the chief of sinners. I struggle. I'm not going to tell you what I struggle with. I've told her from this pulpit before. Alcoholism runs in my veins. I struggle with it. I haven't had I haven't had a drink for since 2007. Praise God for the victory. But it's in me. You want to know why? Because flesh produces flesh. I'm a sinner. And I know my limitations. I know how bad I am. But you know what that does? That makes the cross so much sweeter. That, but God commendeth or proved his love toward us in that while. Oh, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ took it and paid it. And John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You know what that, you know what that means? I think, and I've used this in a sermon before, when, when you go to Lowe's or you go to Menards, and, or I think that's a, a store around here, right? And you go and you buy mulch. They sell mulch at Menards, okay? And you know what you do? You bend down, you pick up the mulch, and you take it away from the store, right? The, when, the, when John said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Here's the sin of the world. He bent down. He reached down from heaven. Took the sins of the world. And he carried them away. He carried them away and cast them into the deepest part of the sea. Separated them as far as the east is from the west. You know, east and west will never meet. They're separated. They're gone. They're paid. They're washed. They'll never come up again because of the cross. Because he has paid it. He's sealed us. He's provided it. He's done all of this grace. He's taken care of our sins. And all he says is, trust me, he must be born again get out of that coat and take the one I have for you catch it you must be born again academics need it religious people need it but all us others we need it too this is Pastor Ryan you've been watching Temple Baptist Church we're so thankful that you took time to check out our live feed here if you're interested, you can come see us on Sunday. We're located at 2937 Legion Drive. That's Newcastle, Indiana. Uh, Sunday school starts at 930. Church is at 1030. And if you have time on Wednesdays, come to our prayer meeting at 7 p.m. We'd be so glad to have you. God bless you.